OK, a question at the back. Jeff Craig. Uh, hi, Ali. Um, I'm just wondering, um, what do you think about the news media coverage of the oil spill? And I'm also wondering about whether you think that's going to prompt broader discussion in the election campaign about, you know, offshore drilling, mm -hmm. um, our reliance on fossil fuels, and whether that's going to give much traction for the Greens. Yeah, so um, I, I think that the, I mean, obviously the, the Rena disaster is a real tragedy. It's a tragedy environmentally, it's a tragedy economically, locally for, for business owners and residents there, and it's, you know, it's kind of heartbreaking. Um, I'm encouraged by, after that kind of initial uh, delay and then the, obviously all the oil that washed up and the, the incredible, terrible visual, you know, impact of that, I'm very encouraged by how well the current salvage operation seems to be going and I'm, you know, I'm pleased that that has kind of come together. Um, I do think it has already prompted a bit of a national conversation about um, deep sea oil drilling and I think that's a good thing. I think it shows that we are ill prepared for even what is considered to be a relatively minor oil spill in this country. You know, we just didn't, we just weren't ready for it. We don't have the infrastructure there to handle it. And, you know, what I always say is that Deepwater Horizon was an exploratory oil well. So we're issuing permits at the moment for exploratory wells. What's to say that, that you know, something similar won't happen and we're just totally inequipped to deal with it. So, um, you know, if one good thing is going to come of it, then if it, if it means we uh, get towards a bit of a consensus around no more offshore permits, then that is a good thing. And it could lead to a higher Green Party vote. Yeah, it could, but, you know, who who's going to celebrate an, an, an environmental disaster? Not the Green Party. Yeah. No, but you might be secretly a little pleased. <laughs> <laughs> Just quietly. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, it looks perfectly timed for um, the campaign. Um, but you know, I mean, the green parties, green parties exist because people's hearts break when they see images like that, and they want to do something about it, and um, and that means stopping those things from happening. Okay, so you can promise no more ones will happen before election day. <laughs> <laughs> it's looking a bit suspicious. Okay, um, so anyhow, talking about drinking again. Mm. Um, <laughs> well, I understand you quite like a drink, as in um, you brew your own beer. Do you? Oh yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So my partner Dave's here, and uh, we brew our own beer at home. And um, we we got a civil union in January. Yep. We had a barbecue the next day, and the, all the beer was our own. Home oh, well brew. done. So, okay, so yeah. drinking age, purchase age. I guess you don't need it if you um, <laughs> bring your own. Your own yeah. That's probably the secret for students. Bring your, <laughs> bring your own. But should there be uh, what? What should the purchase age be? Because if you get into parliament, you'll be having to vote on this. Mm. Um, Probably yep. next year. Yep. Um, I, I and in fact the entire Green Party caucus and our policy is to keep the age at 18. Okay, so um, it's not a conscience vote for you? It's not a conscience vote for us, okay. no. Um, we have policy around this and it's it's to keep the drinking age, the purchase age at 18. Okay. Would you ever consider having no purchase age? Because we had Heather Roy here, um, the libertarian, and she suggested maybe we don't need a drinking age. Um, I mean, our policy around alcohol and, and other drugs is all around harm minimisation and, sure. um, and, and regulation to ensure that, you know, um, that harm is kept to a minimum. Okay. Alcohol is an, an incredibly harmful drug, okay. actually, and so personally I think it's appropriate that we have it. We okay, do what about an age, age for brewing beer? Uh, well, I suppose you do have to purchase the... Um, no, none of it's alcohol, is it, when you purchase yeah. the components? because there's no age involved at all, is there? There's no laws no, around so. brewing alcohol. A yeah. 12-year-old uh, could view it, brew it, couldn't they, and drink it? Um, I work in a supermarket and they can. They can purchase the brewing stuff. Okay. Well, I guess, I mean, you know, a 12-year-old can have a drink at I home mean, too if their parent... Uh, yeah, if their that's right. So, so I would imagine age. their parent yeah. would be noticing if yeah. their 12-year-old was just yeah, peering right. into the carriage <laughs> for mysterious yeah. long periods of time. <laughs> OK, so... Um, what about some other sort of moral issues that we normally ask people about? And students are really interested in these. Mm. So drug reform, do you think um, we should legalise marijuana use? Uh, well, the Green, I mean, the Green Party policy is well known on, on drug law reform. At, again, I would say it's all about harm minimisation okay. and the healthiest lifestyle is a drug-free so that, lifestyle. So that's used so, to legalising it? Uh, it's used to decriminalising it. That's Why not legalising it? Policy. Uh, what, what's the difference? Legalising it means that it's not illegal to have marijuana, whereas decriminalising it means that you don't get put in jail. Okay, for it. so as I, as I understand it, our crime. policy is around, uh, still... you know, it, it makes it um, legal for someone to have marijuana for personal use. So I'm not, I'm not actually that up with the distinction between legalisation sure. and, and sure. decriminalisation, but that's what our policy is. Um, but I think, I mean, I think for me, it's important to emphasise that that's not primarily about personal freedom, it's about harm minimisation and so um, 
as alcohol is a harmful drug, so so is marijuana, and so we want to make sure that um, you know we know it's heavily used in New Zealand, that the way it is used is safe, and that it is regulated um, to ensure maximum safety. So um, that's where that comes from. Okay, um, and since you're currently in a civil union, I, I presume you'd be in favour of full gay marriage? Yep, that's right. So part of the reason that uh, that we chose a civil union is because it was an institution that our gay friends and family could mm. also um, be a part of. Um, and, and for us it was the right choice, I think, uh, because of the kind of moral and religious mm. social connotations of marriage that didn't quite feel right for right. us. I think it's fantastic that we as a straight couple, we have the yeah. choice of a civil union. And so that's something that's not often talked about when talking about ma marriage yeah. and civil union, is that it actually is giving new choices to heterosexual couples as sure. well. And we were really excited to be able to take that up and kind of make a civil union, take the elements of a wedding that we liked and, mm. um, and But it'd be easier that. if it was just across the board, anyone can I, marry. What I would like to see is anyone can marry, anyone can get a civil union. Because isn't, isn't the civil union a bit of a con in the sense that Labor brought it in as a sort of half measure of not really allowing gay marriage? I mean, it, is, it is a bit of a half measure, but for someone like me it's it's perfect it's yeah. exactly what I wanted so what I would like to see is that anyone can get a civil union right. and anyone can get okay. married and so you know the diversity of choices are yeah. available to all types of couples. I saw Matera Tere online yesterday criticising Labour for the civil unions basically saying that it was a cop-out that um, they had the chance to bring mm. about gay marriage but they wimped out. Um, I mean, you know, maybe they did in the sense that they didn't go the full way and make and have marriage equality. But I love the fact that there's a okay. second option available to, to me as well. So, personally, I think we should have a diversity of options, a diversity of choices available for a, a diversity think, of couples. Do you think this is something that's likely to actually get onto the national agenda in the way? I mean, yeah, well, um, we get lots of national MPs on here, and they kind of like just kind of skirt around the issue in Labour yeah. as well. Like they don't really seem to care that much about it. Yeah, I'm really encouraged by the Legalised Love movement, which has just emerged in Wellington. It's a bunch mm. of really passionate young um, young people who are very, very, very passionate about this. Um, and so I went on their march last week, and um, I hope they that I hope they continue and are able to put it on the agenda. Okay, so looking at post-election, we've already talked about national. Um, what about the Mana Party? Um, because we're talking to John Minto next. Mm. Um, what's the relationship like between Greens and Mana? Because Labour have already ruled them out of any coalition, mm. saying we won't work with Mana effectively. What do you um, think? Well, we've got a number of policies in, in common with Mana. I think it's great that there are more voices standing up for, you know, the most vulnerable, mm. poor, poor people, unemployed people. I think it's really important that their voices are heard. Um, I think we've got a slightly different constituency and support base, but. So, so what's the difference there? Uh, in, in policy or no, in sorry, support base? No, sorry, in constituent base? support base, do you think? Um, well, I think, I, mean, I think our environmental record is still the most credible in terms of a, of a party that's really going to put the environment on the agenda. Um, and you know, I think Mana's policy, Mana have got environmental policies as well, but they have mm. very much positioned themselves as, as a party around those social issues for the most vulnerable. Um, we are that, but we are a party about the environment as well. We always have been, so I think that's a key difference. Okay, so if, if there is a chance of Labour forming a government after the election, but they say we refuse to deal with um, the Mana Party to have a Green Labour Mana <laughs> government, what would the Greens do? I mean, this is what surprises me. Would the Greens say, okay, well, Labour have boycott, have vetoed Mana, we'll have a national government? Um, I can't imagine a scenario in which that would be likely to well, happen. Well, Fulgoff said it. That he, uh, yeah. That I mean, not, but I know in terms not, of the numbers in Parliament... Oh, I just that, don't think Labor's going to have any chance of... Um, well, the way it's government. looking at the moment, it's it's looking like... Because um, you know, our preference, we have stated, is, is, yeah. is uh, to, to... If we had the choice to support a, a Labour-led government. Um, but it doesn't look likely that it, that the Labour, Labour and the Greens together would have sufficiencies to govern, and I'm not sure that adding one or two from Mana Party would actually make a difference. Okay, fair enough. Um, talking about those environmental policies which make you different from Mana and the Greens, yeah I mean what do you think of Labour's environmental policies? You know, I think they've been reading Green Party policy. <laughs> oh really? So, yeah. so um, you know I'm pleased to see that they've come up with some fairly robust policy mm. around water. Um, it doesn't go as far as our mm. so our priority around cleaning up our rivers, but you know they are now talking about what they call a resource rental and what we call a, an irrigation charge on irrigation water. Um, I think that's really important. You know, um, we, have, we probably don't even have time to get into water issues in depth, but um, you know I'm encouraged that they are now taking that 
that issue of clean water seriously, um, I think that their policy could and should go further. Right. I guess in terms of environmental issues, the Greens have become more of a, a market orientated party in terms of methods to deal with the environmental uh, potential crisis. Mm. Um, uh, and that seems to be different from the old Greens who were a bit more interventionist. Um, are you comfortable with that shift towards the market? So um, I ETS, guess... ETS, etc. Yeah, um, I mean our preference actually is not for an ETS, it's for a carbon oh, okay. tax. But, um, but, but the Greens we, have always, were the people that put the ETS on the agenda and, and campaigned for it initially. Uh, yeah, but we weren't happy with either Labour or yeah, Nationals' versions of right. the ETS, and and our, our preference for a clean, a, you know, clean and yeah. simple and efficient way to reduce carbon emissions is around a carbon tax. Okay. Um, if we're stuck with an ETS, which looks yeah. like we are at the moment, then there's lots we can do to make it work better. So increasing the carbon price, for example, bringing all sectors in sooner, um, you know. The purpose of an ETS is to reduce emissions, and the one we have at the moment is not actually going to do that. So I think the fundamental thing we have to do is make sure it's fit for purpose and it's actually doing what it's supposed okay. to do. Okay. It looks like we're just about up with time. So just finished with some of your expert um, electoral picks. Um, <laughs> so you've already said that Labour and the Greens will have very little chance of forming a coalition. I mean, it look, I'd love that likely, to happen. But uh, who knows what's going to happen? We've still got four weeks to go. Anything can happen. OK. Um, national? Surely they can't get 50% of the vote, though. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we've seen it before. Parties poll very highly, if, mm. you know, a few months out from the election. And then as it gets closer to the time, voters start to say, yes, we'd actually like to see a check on that, on that power. So um, I think and hope it's likely that they won't be able to govern alone. OK, what about what's going to happen to ACT? I think we might have seen the end of the ACT party. Really? Yeah. So they might not even win Epsom? They might be well, completely out of Parliament? Yeah, it's looking that way and, you know, obviously their leadership change hasn't worked out very well for them. <laughs> OK, <laughs> and what's going to happen with the, the Māori party? Um, I, think they'll get, I think they'll get some of their seats, possibly not all of the ones that they hold at the moment. Um, like you said before, they have uh, maybe suffered a little bit from that curse of, of coalition government. And Mana, you mentioned maybe two or three seats, I think, before. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I th it's looking like Honey will get a seat. Mm -hmm. Just depends on the party vote whether he brings anyone else in with him. And the Greens. Ten percent. Ten percent. It's finally the year to get ten percent. Yeah. And yep. Um, that'll get you in. That'll at get me 12. in at number twelve. Yeah. And how, how are you going to go in South? You know, that's the final question. Now, well, what's, what will be your definition of where well, you won't be unhappy? What's the uh, result? For me, it's all about the party vote. So sure. um, I'd love us to, I'd love to get a 10% party vote for the right. Greens in Hutt South. That's my goal this election. Um, and in terms of the electorate contest, um, I'd like to be a breath of fresh air and an option for people who perhaps um, find Trevor Mallet and Paul Quinn uh, a little, a little much for them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks for coming down. Thank you and for having me. Thanks for being on Vote Chat. Thanks. Okay, thanks.